Hi, I'm Lisa Kudrow. I'm glad you're here today. Mental health care and education is important to me. That's why I chose to become involved at UCLA, joining the Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital Board of Advisors and emceeing the galas and hashtag WOW, the Wonder of Women Summit. I'm so excited that WOW and UCLA's Friends of Semmel Institute Open Mind have joined together to bring outstanding free virtual programs about mental health issues. This means you will hear conversations on the intersection of culture and science between renowned authors and filmmakers who share their personal stories and world-class UCLA scientists that highlight the latest in mental health research, care, and progress. I'm thrilled to welcome you to our Open Mind WOW series and hope to see you at many more programs. Hi, I'm Vicki Goodman. I apologize for the little bit of technical difficulties we had just then, but I hope you had the opportunity to hear Lisa Kudrow say that she's very proud of our Open Mind series that brings together thought leaders in science and culture to present programs about mental health issues as a free public service to the community. We are thrilled that you're here this evening, that you chose to be here instead of with the Dodgers. And we welcome you on behalf of the Friends of the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior, the Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital Board of Advisors, and WOW, the Wonder of Women. We're very grateful to Lisa Kudrow for the warm welcome. I apologize if you didn't get to hear all of it and for her support of mental health programs at UCLA. The Los Angeles Times calls Sandra Singlo a textbook model of the cross-platform artist and also the sanest mad woman in quarantine. She's a celebrated author, essayist, comedian, radio commentator, musician, and performance artist. She's written seven books, including The Mad Woman in the Volvo and Mother on Fire, both which were New York Times best-selling books. And of course, her latest book, The Mad Woman and the Roomba, My Year of Domestic Mayhem, which was written prior to the pandemic and since updated as The Mad Woman and the Pandemic, which we'll hear about today. Sandra Singh Lowe received a bachelor's degree in physics from Caltech, an institution which granted her a Distinguished Alumna Award, its highest honor, and for whom she was the first alumna to give a now famous commencement speech. She combined her communication and science skills into a sideline as the host of The Lowdown on Science, the Radio Science Minute She's hosted since 2005 on NPR, which, has, which is heard weekly by 4 million people. This in turn has sparked other podcasts, including a low life emergency pandemic edition that's been running since April and Sleepless in Los Angeles since June. A Pushcart Prize winner, McDowell Fellow and three time National Magazine Award nominee Sandra is also a contributing editor for the, month, for the Atlantic Monthly and an adjunct associate professor of drama at UC Irvine, where she also teaches science communication. We are also honored to have with us Dr. Susan Buchheimer, who is a distinguished professor of psychiatry and biobehavioral sciences at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, where she holds the Joaquin Fuster Endowed Chair in Cognitive Neuroscience. Dr. Buchheimer is both a neuropsychologist and a neuroscientist and an expert in brain imaging using functional MRI. Her research has examined brain development and brain aging, focusing on both neurological and neuropsychiatric disorders, including autism, ADHD, bipolar disorder, and Alzheimer's disease, just to name a few. Dr. Buchheimer is the director of the UCLA Center for Cognitive Neurosciences and the One Mind 
MRI Research Laboratory and the director of the Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Research Center. We would like to thank both of our distinguished preeminent and superstar women for taking the time from their busy schedules to share their knowledge and expertise with us this evening. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Today's program is being taped. So if any of your friends, family, or others uh, decided to watch the Dodgers instead of being with us today, which I think is a big mistake, um, they will have the opportunity to see the video on the Friends of the Semmel Institute's website, uh, where you will find a link to our YouTube channel. And while you're there, why not check out some of the videos from our other past Open Mind programs? Um, everybody's Zoom has been set in mute, and we ask that it, you please allow it to remain in that mode. We will be having a time for questions and answers. And if you would type your questions in the Q&A, which is at the very bottom of your Zoom, we will try to get to as many of the questions as possible. The program will run about one hour with the last 15 to 20 minutes of questions to, to devoted to your questions. So sit back, relax, and please join me in giving a very warm Zoom welcome to the remarkable Sandra Singlo. Thank you so much. Hello, hello Vicki, it's so great to see you. Thanks for having me on and describing my schedule is busy in the quarantine. We all know what that's like. So what we decided was that we would open and I would talk a little bit about the mad woman and the pandemic, supposedly the sanest, my experience. And then Dr. Bookheimer will come in as though I am the human guinea pig of depression in the pandemic, that's what we're calling it. And then Dr. Bruckheimer will, will, will tell us what it all means. So I think, and I had written this book, The Mad Woman of the Roomba, which was complaining about, it was like a year in the life of all the little small domestic things that we used to worry about, like, oh my gosh, I have mice, or I have ants, or I, a tree trimming is falling, and my children are teenagers, and, you know, now that they got into uh, high school, they don't sleep at all, and now that their grades count, um, they're getting all numbers of the alphabet, all letters, including Greek ones and little emoticons of McDonald's fries and things like that on their AP history. So now comes the pandemic. And I think, um, you know, people will say, how have you been on the pandemic? And I, I just really say terrible. I am one of those people that failed at the pandemic. A few weeks ago, I would wake up on Monday mornings and just the sun would hit my eyes and I would just start crying violently um, that there was another day because I hadn't had a weekend and I hadn't had a week because I wasn't really managing what was happening. And I think when I think back, you know, I'm a writer, so I'm relatively sedentary, um, but I didn't realize that my whole week was glued together with two spinning classes at my local gym, which was Equinox. And I didn't, I don't spin very quickly. I'm not very athletic, but there was something in that activity of driving to the gym, trying to get the good electric parking, electric car parking, the, the, you know, the resounding stamp of the parking ticket, um, jostling for the right spin bike and everybody, all middle-aged people like me were listening to Duran Duran, her name is Rio and she's dancing on the sand, who are in lycra pants, you know, the color of poisonous snakes with our futuristic water bottles and then going and pumping the Kiehl's products in the bathroom, which is itself a kind of cardio. So I never realized how much in a way, and Susan can speak to a little bit, ADHD sort of was built into my life before even going to the grocery store and that that also as the weeks went by and the layers of the onion of the self started to peel away you sort of see I realized I'm a bag of meat I mean I think our our actually DNA is 97 percent similar to chimpanzees which can be depressing but then maybe it's I find it sometimes cheering because like but I can still type, that's good. So I realized just how much of a bag of meat that I was uh, and, to, and that I would have to 
desperately find new ways to be in this pandemic. And what I found was, as the weeks went by, I thought that people uh, were in a, one of four apocalypse selves. The first became the farmers, and these are my friends, and surely you have them. They start doing the sourdough bread, and they're growing produce as big as, you know, brontosauri in their backyards and they're remodeling their bathroom and they've never had such a good time or been so productive and they're amazing. The second I call the warriors, which would be my partner who's up watching in the bedroom right now, of you know the 24 seven news alert people, my partner who's a very handsome and very well put together metrosexual, just in solidarity with the horror of the time grew this big pandemic beard, sort of the Santa Claus beard. <laughs> And started like our bedroom became kind of like there was like a war room map of every country it was like getting a PhD in, in coronavirus. The third self I called the slackers, which are these teens. And I had a kid senior year high school totally canceled. So these kids are expected to do these AP Zoom classes while they're getting their college rejection letters and locked in their room. So if some weed was ingested, we won't say who. Um, that's the best those teens could do. And then the fourth, I called the manic depressive busy bees, which was like me, which is like a busy mom, working mom, we always have a project. So these became apocalypse projects. So at the beginning of the Kubler-Ross stages, as I called it of this, although instead of five stages of the pandemic, it seems they're like 47, uh, where it's kind of we're in California, we're at the head, we're gonna flatten the curve and I'm gonna design t-shirts that are called flatten the curve and we're gonna zoom together. It's gonna be amazing. And it's gonna be open much sooner than we think. So these beautiful you know, occasions we have with our children, uh, those talks in the afternoon that we never had, this is gonna be over super soon. Uh, and of course it wasn't. And so, so the anger for me came down <laughs> where I realized I really was not good at this. There was no sense of mission because all and no sense of purpose. It's just stay at home and don't move. Your job is to not even to stub your toe on a grocery cart and go to the emergency room to, you know, to get in the way of essential workers. So I found that all I could do couldn't go to the park, couldn't go play tennis, not that I played very well, couldn't go to a trail. The only place you literally could go was the grocery store. And so that was became going to the grocery store, became like going to Magic Mountain, you know, with the mochaccino and whipped cream and whatever was so exciting. So that, that became a bit of a destination. And after the first rush of, oh my God, they don't have tuna and eggs, our store started getting restocked. But I was still in the panic mode of going, I, I, uh, I'm gonna get four boxes of German chocolate cake mix and um, some salami. So much salami, I, maybe I could fold the salami into a face mask for an emergency. Worker. So, of course, then what happens is the COVID, they call it the COVID-19 pounds. I don't even know. I haven't been on a scale. I'm wearing elastic waistband pants. And I think because sometimes the only thing we could do is comfort ourselves in food. So the weight gain is something that the Germans have a word for it, and it's Kummerspeck. And the definition is weight gain through emotional overeating. So all you can do is sit there and eat. The, you know, the second to last thing that happens for me is, of course, I am quarantining with my partner. We're a middle aged couple because my teens are coordinating at their dad's across town. So that's how that we that's how that worked out. So I always think a quarantine of two is like a stool with two legs. It gets bad. So we like I noticed and other couples, especially middle aged ones or women who are post metabolic like me, I'm 58 of like the sound of our partner, like the sound of your partner chewing becomes like amplify. And my partner started wearing flip-flops. Like when did he wear flip-flops? The sound of the flip-flops or the sounds made reading the paper in the morning. And then sometimes men of a certain age like to do like funny voices, old man voices. And it's like, ah, so the only, because we're together all day. So I think one thing I learned in it is kind of like we started to play some board games, which is a new thing for us. We started to play tennis, which is a new thing for us. So I think one thing that I gradually learned is not to lower our expectations of our partners. Like we are, you know, we're a couple of like a late, not like midlife couple. And instead of saying, you know, I love how the way you and I communicate, your statement to your partner is hit it to my, hit it to my forehand my effing forehand now because we're like in a whole new world. So I've 
to a certain extent, I learned to lower my standards with that. And then I started uh, going to the beach in Malibu with friends of mine. And of course, in the pre-pandemic times, LA hosting used to be the great sushi restaurant for the great theater opening or the great lobster recipe. And now it's just drive 90 minutes, meet me there, park over there if you have to pee, pee in the ocean. But because standards are so low, I have been meeting with friends and that has helped enormously to get out of the house once a week and see this huge panorama of life and sound and smell around me. So that's been a little bit of my journey. So I'm doing better. And now I'd like to welcome Dr. Buchheimer on to say, okay, are there any of the themes that I've gone through, are they what other people are going through? And what do we understand about the brain and the self that you can speak to here? Thanks, Sandra. It's really great to, to hear you talk about all of the things that I think every single one of us is experiencing, but with humor, which is so desperately needed at a time like this. It's like we're living in this time warp, like the space-time continuum has broken down, and one day is like every other day, weekends, days of the week, times of the day, it doesn't matter. Um, I used to get up in the morning every morning and get dressed and do my hair and do my makeup. And now I'm lucky if I'm out of jammies uh, by noon. Because why? No, I'm in Zoom all day. Nobody can see <laughs> all of the ways. Right. And, it's, and this is really a universal experience. One of the things that I think that... Um, uh, that really rings true when you talk about your time out and going to Malibu and just trying to to make something seem real again is 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 um, it's so important to remember that human beings are social beings by nature. I mean, we are built to be social. We have special areas in our brain. We have a whole network of brain regions that are that are designed from birth. Actually, they appear at birth. Uh, to be social, to, to orient us to being with other people. And so to suddenly be in a world where we can't see people safely, and even when we do see them, we're, we're doing this thing with the elbow and, and stuff like that, it is, it is so unnatural for us. And it is, it is not in any way surprising that all of us are having issues. We're having depression, we're having anxiety, we're, we're having every kind of issue. Uh, because it's so incredibly unnatural not to be able to see people when we want to. Um, even people who are kind of um, not real social normally, at least we'll get out of the house and see people every day anyway. Right. And what do you think about, because I know we're often on our phones and with our media and the internet, and we've been on that more, but it like, that's not a real world. And so I think there's sometimes a way that I'm stimulated through the apps on my phone. We're not even going to talk about the election. That would be another 10 hours um, of like that the world creates a whole, but, but it isn't. It's, it's very flat and it's stimulating stuff in our brain. It seems that it's not helpful. It's interesting. I think that um, having spent almost every single day on Zoom since the pandemic started, uh, it, there is something that is very different about um, being on Zoom, even though in many ways it feels like you're being social. And, and I encourage people to set up Zoom dates and Zoom uh, happy hours and Zoom family gatherings. I think it's good. But, um, but one thing that I, I had pointed out to, um, uh, earlier to, uh, to you and I'll point out to the audience is that Zoom isn't natural. And I'm going to take off my glasses just to demonstrate this. I'm looking at you right now. And, um, and if you look closely at my eyes, you'll see that it doesn't feel like I'm looking at you because you're not where my camera is. My camera is up here. So now I'm looking at my camera. And if I'm smiling and looking at my camera, you might actually almost feel like I'm looking at you and smiling, which feels a whole lot better than if I'm looking down here and it seems to you like I'm looking at your chest, right? Um, Eye contact is so important for humans that we are, our brains are able to detect differences in eye position that are just millimeters, just the tiniest bit. And our brains actually react differently if we're looking straight at something and just a little bit off to the side. Our brains know the difference between that tiny little angle. We'll respond emotionally to a face that, has, that conveys an emotion that's looking straight at us the exact same emotion if the eyes are just slightly averted, completely different brain activity, none of the social brain areas light up. So even though we're trying to socialize with Zoom, we're missing some of the key components. And that's just, that's just the eye 
movement part of it. There's also like the touch. I'm not touching you. It's weird not for humans not to be touching one another. We, we miss that feeling of, of, of touching. Right. And also, I think the Zoom, the, the Zoom meetings from morning to night. So in a way, you can get a lot more done because I teach at UC Irvine. I'm happy not to have to do that drive. But it is I find that I actually now miss being the car. Everything that I used to complain about my mad woman in the Roomba world of kind of traffic or sitting on the 10 or whatever, in a way that gave us a weird break between all these meetings that are this close that you're listening to the radio or to your rock station. And that break is almost, I don't know, I feel I missed that. Yeah, your mind can wander. And it turns out that those moments of mind wandering, that's actually when your brain consolidates information. That's when we remember stuff. That's where our minds also get to to go freely and come up with ideas unrestrained um, by our, our circumstances. I'm sitting on Zoom all day, and instead of being able to just kind of look at the world the way I normally would, I am looking at this little tiny little center of my screen, this tiny, to look at this tiny little face that I can see. And not only is it extremely unnatural, but it requires me to pay attention to this small little detail when normally my attention span is wide and open and I have a lot of different pieces of information coming in at once. You can't um, create, you can't have free roaming ideas if you are sitting there focused on a little tiny thing. I wonder if that's something that, that you notice just in your, because you're a creative person. Yeah, no, I totally, that rings true because when I um, first had my first child in 2000, I thought, oh my gosh, this is gonna really break up my writing schedule. But it turned out I used to write for Buzz Magazine, LA Magazine, I had a thousand words to write a month and I would procrastinate the first 20 days and then play Spider Solitaire and just cram it in at the rest because I was young and I kind of had all that time. As Soon as my baby came, those naps were 90 minutes or 2.15, so I crammed it in there. And then I realized, you know, we have that dream of sitting at our computer on a Monday and I'm gonna write for eight hours, but you're exactly right. I remember driving the minivan and ideas would come to me driving along the freeway. So I started putting post-its like I have like right here onto the dashboard of the minivan. I just thought about that when you, I had forgotten about that, but that's when ideas come, not when you're sitting in front of the blinking blank screen of the computer. And, um, oh my gosh, I'd never thought, I had not thought about that until you said that. Yes, uh, creativity uh, really requires that your mind wander. And um, not just creativity, but also putting things together. That's how our memory works. We, we, we experience this today, we experience this other thing, and our brains, when we're not thinking about one thing, will kind of put all these elements together and make sense of it all. We do this in our sleep, we do this when we're in the shower, we do this whenever we're not being bothered by something. And now here we are today, staring at these little tiny screens all day long. And if you, you can't let your mind wander because if you just kind of go like this, the person is looking at you, they know that you're wandering off. You can't get away with it. You can't get away with, with uh, just looking aside and, and you know, just averting your eyes for just a minute. They can see everything right there. And so we end up demanding this attention all the time. And then a person with ADHD, as you described, that must be really rough. And I think something that you mentioned earlier in terms of our relationships and what we miss that now that we didn't know that we had before. So we have all these Zoom meetings. We're on family Zooms all the time. We're this close. The children are hanging out of their bunk beds. They can, <laughs> it's kind of like, and it's kind of intense. And you can kind of see yourself and, and just go, oh my gosh, look at what is this, you know, Zoom neck. Um, but then also there's those little things about going to, let's say the grocery store, my new favorite place, um, and just, just how special to just appreciate the shopping cart person that's putting it away. And you say, thank you behind your mask. And those sort of small granular interactions with people just farmer's market or sort of in the town square that we miss. And those are, those relationships can be just so simple and so positive if somebody waves you in with your car. It, it's kind of this nice sense of well-being that we has really gone out when we're at home getting our groceries delivered. So yeah, we are we're used to being able to do whatever we want. And so we do take advantage or or, or just uh, not pay attention to a lot of these things. But it's kind of like now we are all living in a sensory deprivation chamber. We have the exact same sensations every single day, the exact same physical environment, the exact same partner. 
And as you were mentioning before, you know, suddenly noticing all of these sounds that your partner is making. And I did the same thing. I noticed that my partner makes a certain sound and I'm like, oh my gosh, he's doing it all the time. He does it once a minute. He's doing it. Set <laughs> <laughs> <That> me. <laughs> because, because this is something you would never notice because we're normally our, our lives are filled with all of the sensory stimulation, visual and auditory and new environments. We're always seeing novelty. Our brains seek out novel novelty. We pay attention to novelty. Um, but on the other hand, when we see the same stuff every single day, we start to just lose track of it. And then anything little that stands out is like screaming at us because we are, it, we're, it's like we're in a sensory deprivation chamber. And, and I, I wonder also in terms of relationships, because I've become really fascinated in this living in my house of two, where even food becomes so repetitive or, and I, now the four uh, scariest words in the English language are, I'm defrosting some shrimp. <laughs> it's like, no, not more shrimp. Like shrimp is usually fine. Now it becomes the emblem of like, no, nah, shrimp, I got defrosted shrimp. But I think that, and just with my friends that we started, we were girlfriends, we go to the beach where I realized probably, and we all talked about people of a certain age, I'm 58, I'm sort of a mid Gen X boomer really, um, of like, well, when we get older, we want to all move into an a commune, like an artist commune. We're not going to go to the old age and we're not going to be stuck here, a commune. And I realized just in spending this little bit of time and this with my friends, and it's pretty, we call it low quality time. We're sitting there for two or five hours. There's some conversation, somebody's reading a book. It doesn't matter. And I noticed even with my partner, I've heard all of his stories probably a hundred times and he's heard mine, but when he tells it to a new group, it's fresh to them. And they and I go, we should be doing more, more of this communal thing that maybe our units aren't the couples or the couples and their children, but there's something about our friendships and our extended family where you can have these conversations that are super slow or they stop in the middle and they're not really directed. And maybe that was the first thing about the pandemic that was good that I did start talking to people on the phone and it wasn't like the latest LA, what's your new project? Nobody had any projects. So everybody started gardening. And I, I think those kinds of relationships, it, it just felt better in my brain to have these just really low tech conversations about gardening, even though my gardening is terrible and I've never seen arugula get so weedy and nasty. <laughs> I don't know what happens. So, so I wonder if there's going to be a place there to have these relation, these friendships that are maintain these friendships in a slightly different way. Well, it's interesting. I, I'm I'm not sure what's going to happen because none of us know really what's going to happen in the end. But I do think that all of us are are having to re-experience all of our relationships because every relationship has now fundamentally changed from what it used to be, no matter who it is. Uh, the guy at the grocery store is a new person now, and your partner is a, an old person again, <laughs> again, again, again. And, and our, our, our friendships are very, very different. If you're like me, you, you built a pod, a small pod of people, right. none of whom go outside your pod. And I love my pod. Um, and it's such a joy to be able to see my friends in, in my pod. And it is extremely freeing. Boy, do you appreciate how much we need that social interaction. And, and you're right, it's not about what did you do today? Or, hey, have we not done this thing together? Or what are we doing on Friday night? It's just the pure joy of seeing another human being <laughs> in your presence um, and having that, uh, just any kind of social contact. Right, and maybe, yeah, I'm sorry, maybe it's not agenda directed. It's not like we're going to my kid's graduation you're coming to my theater show, I'm going to your event. And obviously that there's so much politics right now that's in the air. It's not even necessarily drafting somebody to go on your campaign. It is, it's not mission oriented, which I think is, is really, I don't know, it strikes me as different than before. Well, I think that most of the time we have these very, very busy lives. And so we have to build into these structures and these appointments essentially to see people. So I've got an appointment to see some friends this Friday night. I have an appointment to see other friends a week from Sunday. Um, and it's so, it, I mean, in a way it does become contrived. Not that I don't love that. Um, in fact, I really miss it terribly, but, um, but we, we're normally very busy people. And just the pure joy of being able to just sit with, with people and hang out and talk and have no agenda at all. We can't go out anyway, right? We can't go out to the movies. We can't go out to dinner. Um, so it does create a new kind of relationship. And I, I think that um, 
that people differ a lot and have to differ during this pandemic in how they are managing that. And I, I do believe that how well we are doing emotionally and, and in, in terms of our mental health is, um, is really dependent upon how we're doing and managing these new relationships. Is in a sense, every single relationship we're in right now is a brand new relationship. How are we going to deal with that? And, right. and we're having structure and, and, and now we don't, we don't have structure. Right. No, I, I think that's that's one of the really some of the wisdom to come out of this. And if there's any hope or positivity that will come out of this is, um, yeah, I feel like I'm negotiating my relationships with my girl, with my female friends. And I remember one couple of weeks, it was like, I'm doing really badly. I am really depressed. So if I can just come over to your house Thursday and sit on your curb while you we have coffee in cups that's what I'm going to do. So it's just to be really candid about what's going on and not have to cover it up because a lot of the situational depression is, is a lot about that. And, you know, my, actually my 20 year old daughter said, and mom, you have to try something new every day. Like Thursday is ice cream day. And I was just hung on to everything she was saying. I also noticed that for a few weeks, I just couldn't read the paper every morning. Like my partner does. Now I've gone back to the crossword, but I think, I think just watching how much news I was taking in was a really, I could just viscerally feel the toxicity of many of the things that were happening come into my come in, into my being. So managing managing that because the news is a big you know it, it's it's a very big business now, and so they can they they have our attention. They can do that. Um, so I, I hope that as per what you're saying, one thing that will come out of this is that the new specialness of this of not having to have the important event to invite people to, but it's like come to my backyard and let's be bored together for 90 minutes and bring your own wine. <laughs> um, so I think there's an opportunity to do that. And I think, um, I know like my other, my kids are both at UCs and my younger one is at UC Berkeley, to totally in COVID. So they're one person to a dorm of three. And then I think, you know, a couple of weeks in, if they all pass their tests, then they can be in a bathroom pod together of 10 or 12, but you don't get to pick them. But these are the people that you can see, but you don't get to pick them. <laughs> it's kind of like we're driving up through the, you know, the firestorm and whatever on the five, where in August, it's kind of like, what's going to happen next? The apocalypse, the uh, ro giant robot spiders, what's going to happen next? And it was kind of like, if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with, well, that's your pod. You don't get to pick your pod. It's not a cool pod, but they're the ones you get to see. So if you can manage enduring them at all, those are your people. And I think that that's, you know, it's a new thing that we don't have, we can't be as picky. Yes, and you know, I, I think that, uh, that you make a good point generally in that um, we, we tend to expect a lot of ourselves. And as you mentioned earlier, there are some people who are out there, I've got one friend who's baking a new loaf of bread every single day. I, I just want to strangle her. I can't bake a new loaf of bread every day. And, and some days it's just hard to get out uh, to get out of bed. And I think that, um, and of course, 2020 has been bad in so many ways. And by the time we got to murder hornets, that was just, that, that was just <laughs> really murder hornets, come on. Um, and I think that it's important for us just for our mental health to give ourselves permission to not bake bread every day and to not um, be happy every day and to say, it's okay for me to feel crummy today. I need to just get out of the house. I'm up in San Francisco now where it's, it's um, cloudy way, way too much of the time and cold way too much. And so every once in a while I go crazy and I have to get in the car and drive up north into um, Napa area in Marin County where there's actual sunlight and remind myself that there is sun in the world. I, I think it's important that all of us give ourselves permission to not be so perfect during this time. I, I think it, particularly about the parents who have children at home. Well, I guess you've got a, 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 some at home who are trying to be teachers and trying to teach fourth grade math um, while they're trying to do their job and still have a partner and still stay sane at the same time. I, I'm, I'm, I will never be a good math teacher. And I think <laughs> that many of us will never be a good math teacher. And I, it, at some level, we have to say, look, everything bad is happening right now. And it's okay if I am 
not a good math teacher, if I am in a really bad mood today and I just have to check out or I have to go for a drive because I'm going to drive myself crazy, it, it's okay for us not to be baking a new loaf of bread every single day. Yeah, and I think the it's appreciating a new appreciation for what we have because it is a weird bit. Many of us who are privileged to work from home, as I can, telecommute, there are, you know, there aren't air raid sirens. We're not running from zombies in an apocalypse as we would be, which is I like to say burns a lot more cardio. Uh, and but I think the other day, as I'm, I'm thinking, you know, it's kind of like we have ant, we, every summer we have ants in our kitchen. Just the heat drives them in, and yeah, in the before times. I would take Windex and pay, just ah, I get really acid. And, and like I mentioned the other day, this time I go, there may come a day where I'll say to my partner, remember when the earth had ants? Now we don't see ants anymore. <laughs> you know, and this was shortly after, remember we had an earthquake on top of everything and the air quality is like 187, three, like it's beyond Bangladesh. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, we're kind of like, so I just, I just kind of let them go. It's like, well, they'll be here tomorrow. They probably won't be here in two weeks because it's just the heat that drives them in our kitchen is the usual messy kitchen. So it's, it's a, those levels of things. And I started thinking, well, and uh, as long as there is more house than ants, that's gonna be okay. <laughs> so if it gets to half ants, half house, maybe they'll think about it, but it's like they're eventually gonna go this kind of, fixing it now, go to the store to get the Windex. It's kind of like, it's a natural thing. And then they're just gonna go away. So, uh, you know, and that, all, not that I've all, always been a great housekeeper. Everybody knows that I'm a terrible housekeeper in <laughs> my car. So maybe that's not so surprising. Um, but but yeah, I think that we're appreciating things. And I think like you're saying, let the standards be low and we're here day by day. Yeah. We are here. I mean, I think if we are getting through the day with all that's going on, we are accomplishing a lot. Uh, and I, I think that's very important. I think um, I, I gave myself permission to stop listening to the news. It, I think that we all have to see where our anxiety level is. We know that there's tremendous stress in the world and stress is toxic. And stress is very, very toxic to our bodies and to our brain. For a short term, it's fine, right? We, we get anxious and upset when something is wrong and it motivates us to fix it and that's fine. But our brains are, are not meant to act on stress that stays with us and it actually causes brain damage over time. Um, it's associated with many long-term changes, not in brain structure and brain function, and also in, in um, diseases that, that occur uh, later on in life, in, including Alzheimer's disease. And that uh, stress is a, is a risk factor um, for, for dementia. Um, wow. And, and heart disease yeah. and everything else. So, um, so, so it's really important for us to manage our, our stress and to do what we can uh, to manage that. And that will mean sometimes um, doing something that you might normally not do. <laughs> like normally I might be glued to the news and I would know everything that is happening. And right now I'm thinking like, no, I'm going to lower, <laughs> I'm gonna take that down 10 notches and get through the day and give myself permission to not be upset about something that I can't do too much about anyway. Um, and, and I'm not going to be up on the news and somebody might say to me, oh, you know, Susan, you should, don't you know who's up in Kentucky right now? Like, I, nope, I don't know the numbers. I don't care. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be chill and save my brain. Yeah, and I think I know that I love that term that Richard Saul Werman as a futurist coined, I think in the 70s or 80s, called information anxiety. Uh, and, the, you know, the factoid was an average copy of the New York Times has more information than an average 17th century British villager came across in his or her entire lifetime. And so information anxiety is where you have all, more information than you can do anything about. So it just comes at you and comes at you and you can try to sort of help or bat it off, but you can't do anything with the global news being what it is. It's a real, yeah, it's a real thing and there's nothing sort of clicking on Facebook to the same people who are already on our side who <laughs> vote the way that we're voting. It's, I, I think that's a real, it's a real thing. Yes, so. I mean, it reminds me, you telling me uh, about your partner who's the um, COVID addict and, <laughs> and I, you know, I, I had to decide, okay, I will look at the numbers each day, but that's it. I'm not gonna go through every state and every city anymore and think about where things are getting worse. I'm going to be as careful as I can 
and take care of myself and my loved ones and leave it at that. And, and I think that's an important lesson for, for all of us um, when we're thinking about trying to preserve our mental health during this crazy, crazy time, a time that the, something like this happens once every 100 years. Yeah. Uh, our grandchildren will be talking about 2020 and, and we'll be telling them, um, oh, well, I remember way back then and we'll be telling them how awful uh, it was. It, it is unprecedented. We are living in an unprecedented uh, time right now and, and we will get through it. Um, but, um, but I think that we need to give ourselves permission to not be these great super moms super teachers, super uh, employees, super all the things that we always want to be. I don't know if you're an overachiever like me, but I'm always thinking that I have to do everything on time and everything extremely well, and I'm taking on all these responsibilities. It's too much. And we have to be okay with saying enough is enough. Uh, this is good enough. There'll be ants in my house. It's okay. You know, they're, they're not gonna eat me <laughs> and we'll do this together. <laughs> I, I hate to disturb the conversation, which is so incredibly stimulating and interesting. And you two really are, you should take this on the road. You are wonderful <laughs> together. Um, but we do have some questions and uh, we'd love to get to them because our audience is very anxious to, to ask them. So um, the first question is from Kathy to Sandra. Once the weather changes and the beach is out, where will you and your friends be meeting? I think well, so. I'll, certainly, I'll certainly let Kathy know where it is. If <laughs> is. So I think um, we're going to push the beach as long as it can go because you can distance on the beach. October, November are really the best months. And as I'd like to say, because I have to be in a mindset of yes, that's where I am now. So I think when the COVID came down, it's kind of like, it's better to stay in, it's better to sue, don't go out the air, et cetera, et cetera, that I have to be proactively out and having an adventure no matter what it is. So maybe in January, February, it won't be that cold that the ocean may be colder, but the air will be colder also. So, and I go into the water every time in my really bad swimsuit that I can't really fit my body into. I'm, I look like a beach ball now, but um, I think I'm just determined to go in there because the ocean is really, in incredible and some people go into nature and they like that for me the ocean just gets completely wipes it clean every week so good question kathy but i think i'm going to try to push through you know what I, i'd like to just add to that nature and outdoors and sunshine are really really good for mental health um seeing the sunlight is an antidepressant and i think that a lot of us don't realize when we stay inside all day as as we, most of us are doing now we are in these unnatural lights that are natural depressants we need to be outside and we need to be exposed to the light and to these natural antidepressants that's really interesting and i also want to thank you both uh, for giving us all permission to not do everything perfectly and to not, if we don't feel okay, that's okay. Um, it's really wonderful and comforting to hear that from a, a brain specialist, especially. So thank you for that, Susan. Um, we have a comment here from Albert who says, I'm appreciating the informal conversation between the two women, informative, action oriented, and with humor. I will definitely recommend that friends watch this on YouTube. My only disappointment is that I can't get my book signed. And I think a lot of us feel that way. Um, it's something when we had our programs in person at UCLA, when our open mind was, was still at UCLA and not on Zoom, we always had book signings. And it was really special to be able to have your book signed by the author who you just got to hear speak. So um, if it's okay with you, Sandra, we'll send a link to people so they can at least purchase the book. I don't know how they could do it. And ask you, they go to my website, sandrasonlow.com, they can Venmo me and then I can autograph and send them a book. And actually during, cause my book came out in June at the height of the pandemic, um, I did COVID safe curbside pickup book signings out of my garage. Uh -huh. so <laughs> 
<laughs> I had them in a food bag and it was really, people would come on every 30 minutes so we would visit from 10 feet away, people that I'd never met. And so that was actually pretty, it was not the huge crowds of UCLA, but it was, it, it was so I've been doing that. So they can go to my website and, and Venmo me and I can, I can send Albert a copy. Fabulous. Fabulous. Um, we have another question here about masks. And Susan, you were talking a lot about eye movement. And what about when we do have the opportunity to be out, out and about, even if we're just taking a walk, and we're all wearing masks, so you can't see a smile or a facial expression. And you know, I wondered about that and that effect on the brain. Yeah, um, that's a really interesting question. And actually, I've been talking with my daughter about that because I have a new grandson um, whose whole life experience has been people with masks. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, is the brain going to develop differently in these children who can't read emotions in the faces anymore? Um, it, I, it worries me because we, we actually do have areas of the brain that are specialized for face processing and for processing face emotions. And they did, although we have them probably um, dully formed when we are, are young, they, are, they develop um, throughout. And, and I'm, I'm suddenly thinking that, oh my gosh, are we going to have this generation of, of young children who don't know how to read facial expressions because they've had a year of deprivation of that? Um, and what I have found instead um, and, and, I, and I do think that's true because as we pass people, I, I sometimes feel like, well, first of all, everybody in San Francisco wears a, a mask. Um, so I never see anybody's, and, and, you know, anybody's mouth or face. And, so, and when you pass people, you don't know if they're smiling um, or they're frowning or they're sticking their tongue out at, at you. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing that I have noticed is that um, I pay more attention to the eyes and I think other people do. When you smile, we smile with our eyes as well as our, our faces. And I think that what is happening is that we are slowly becoming better subconsciously at reading emotions in the eyes um, because we don't have all these other clues uh, uh, to look at. I'd like to think that that's true. Um, it would be really interesting if we could do brain scanning of, of people before and after and look at how their brains are responding to facial expressions versus eye expressions, because I, I, I have to think that our, our brains are slowly now developing expertise in doing super fine detections of emotion based on a very small amount of information. But we don't know. That, that could be a future PhD study. <laughs> I guess we can't wear sunglasses then because that would take that away too. I think Susan, you hit your mute button. And I did, yes. Yeah, I, I was just agreeing with you. Yes, sunglasses and a mask is a complete blank. Actually, it's, it almost sounds threatening. <laughs> and add a baseball cap and yeah. you don't even know who's there. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. We have a question here from June about living alone during this challenging time. You really have to enjoy your own company, but you crave other voices and opinions. So how do you stay mentally healthy in this time if you live alone? And I know that affects a lot of people and um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I can start and say something just quickly before I, um, but I think, um, <clears throat> I wonder if I if I were living alone, it's like I find um, yes. I mean, we, we can have Zoom meetings and we can have that, and there's a lot of interaction that way. Um, and this is just small, but I don't know. I, I found like going to the farmers market that we're allowed to do out here in Pasadena, COVID safely distanced, to uh, you know a, a day, uh, just that kind of connection with others. We can't have those kind of visceral, you know, kind of one-on-one -on -one and touching, as you've said, is a big thing. But um, I don't know, it, just being out in the world where one can be has been enormously helpful for me and just see, seeing people around and interacting in a very in a very minor way. So, but. Yeah, I think that's really important. And I, I think it, it's very concerning for people who are living alone. And I've spoken to several and uh, a few are, are really having trouble by now. I think that it's, it's, it's okay at first, and then it has been getting worse and worse. And I've had um, uh, at, at least some people say, I am going back now to stay with my parents because I, I can't be alone anymore. 
it's not natural for us to be alone this much. And I think Sandra's suggestion is, is terrific, is just to get outside. Even if you're just seeing strangers, it's way better than sitting inside by yourself. There, there is very little worse in this world than sitting in a small room by yourself with four walls around you and no humans at all. It's way better to be outside, even if you're seeing people at a distance, even if they're just going grocery shopping. And of course, you know, Zoom is a great thing. And, and um, I, I know some people have done very well with doing things like Zoom dinner dates and Zoom family gatherings and Zoom girls night out and uh, Zoom happy hour, which I try to do several times a week if, uh, if I can. Um, I, these are all really important things to do to make you feel a little less isolated, but, but you're right. Being on a Zoom is not like being with a person. Just watching a person in real life uh, walk by you is more rewarding than seeing somebody on Zoom. And, um, and, and that's what, what we have to do just to, you know, just to make do. It, it's, it's very, very difficult. And a lot of people are having problems right now. It's tough times. Yeah. Um, from Sherry, Sandra, we just love your humor and insights in our crazy situation with the pandemic. I can relate to every story and observation you brought up. What would you say is the worst thing about this new physical distance state of our lives and what is the best? Also, do you still play the bio viola? I sat next to you in the Santa Monica High Symphony Orchestra in 1977. Right, and since I sat seven out of seven violas, that means Sherry was with me in the back. Um, and no, I actually gave up viola and I picked up the violin at 45 because it's smaller and easier to play. And I felt I was having the last laugh for a long time. I mean, I would say the worst thing, and it's emotional about this physical distancing thing that I just knew in myself. And I think it came around about labor, oh, no, it was 4th of July. And so we had really good friends and we had done one COVID distance barbecue that was very successful and everybody brought their own utensils and like, and that and we were looking forward to another one 4th of July. And then again, the COVID cases go up. Uh, it's a heat wave. And I just felt more and more like always the sensible thing to do is to go to bed and don't do anything that is sensible. Don't go anywhere. Don't, you know, don't. And, and I think, <clears throat> I started feeling very helpless and I could, I had no sense of agency. And so, and of just, I guess I'll wait till that, you know, even though nothing, no one invites us anywhere. We don't invite anyone out. We just sit here in this house while I listen to the slap, slap, slap of my partner's bit dots. So I think that <laughs> the worst thing, the worst thing was this sense of, of um, fearfulness and of like going, well, of like if the farmer's market is open in Pasadena and people are distancing, you could probably meet with a friend of a distance of 10 feet or whatever with your own beverages in a backyard, even for an hour, that would be totally huge. And so we, to understand the risks and then be safe, but be proactive of doing all we can to be social and not just make it all a Zoom thing. Because, and we can, you can distance outdoors and kind of like be careful and do that. So I think the worst thing was a sense of, doing less and less things um, and just, just rolling over into like a little ball and, uh, you know. Um, but the best thing has been kind of reconnecting with people, having these new conversations going, okay, I'm super depressed. We never got together for dinner more than, now we're gonna do it once a week or at the beach in a very low tech way. So, so I think that new, new connections of people and new, that has been really, and that we're all in the same boat. So there's no excuses and there's no shame. I think the kind of the shame, okay, I, I've gained 20 pounds, I have ants, I'm really super depressed. You know, my, you know, the best thing about the pandemic was wearing a mask when I went to the grocery store to put all the rosé in my baskets. I know it's <laughs> like, it's like, like the standards are low and we all connect with each other. We're all in the same boat so we can form new connections. And I think that's the best part. That's a, that's a silver lining to form new connections. Absolutely. Um, another question here from Stacy about the isolation with, for adolescents. Oh. Uh, it's such a tough time to mm -hmm. be cut off from your friends and um, everything is, school is on Zoom, life is on Zoom. So everything is uh, on, on the computer and um, 
you know, I myself have a 14 year old granddaughter and I see, you know, that's how her life is right now. And I, I, what are, what do you think the effects are gonna be on this generation that's, you know, spending at least a year learning on a computer and not getting to see their friends? Well, I, I can do the short personal experience and then Susan will come in with the wisdom and the information. <laughs> I mean, I have two kids, 18 and 19. So one senior year got totally destroyed and the other was going back to call and it just kind of, so both of my kids, even though they have to isolate and all classes are remote, they both went back to their UCs because they just had to get out of their, away from their parents and they just couldn't take it anymore. So that was a bit of proactivity for them. Um, I mean, some of the Zoom stuff is, it, it can be very stultifying, but some of the teaching is, can actually be really good in this time. So. I, I don't know how they'll survive because they're a bit older. I think on younger children, I really can't imagine even like what Susan was saying with the younger children, what that's going to be like. I don't know. Yeah, from an educational point of view, the Zoom uh, learning is very good for some individuals and very bad for others. Uh, children with disabilities are, are particularly affected. Uh, it's, it's very, very hard for them. And also children with ADHD are um, very affected. It, it's, quite hard um, for them to pay attention to this little Zoom screen. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of children are going to be behind a year. Um, I have to remind myself, um, as I think we all must, that not only do we have to give ourselves a break, we've got to give our, our kids a break. Our kids may have a really bad year and they may not learn much, um, but they'll learn more next year and it'll be okay. So I think that's important. But I, I do think you raise a, an extremely important question about teenagers in particular who are going uh, through this. Um, so, uh, it, so there's been a, a fair amount of research in adolescents showing that in these um, early teenage years, uh, the brain um, makes some fundamental changes and suddenly at, with the hormones as well and becomes very externally oriented. That's part of why kids are, are so horrible to their parents at this age. Their brains are driving them to leave the home, to go outside the home and to make new social connections. So their social brains become hyper active. Uh, mm -hmm. They are hyper excitable and um, more socially oriented, more oriented towards novelty, doing new things. It's also of course more oriented towards dangerous things, but the idea is that the brain is primed at, at these teenage years to get out of the home and to explore new things. And so to suddenly put these kids in a world where they can't do what their brains are screaming for them to do, it, it is really, really hard. And I guess it's probably no surprise that a lot of our young college students are being reckless and passing disease around because their brains are just giving them a powerful message that I need to get out and socialize and do crazy stuff. And the world is telling them, no, no, you cannot do that. And I don't know what's going to happen. It, it's, it's, it's very difficult because this is a critical period of development. And um, we're waiting to see what will happen. We're actually doing some studies across the country and UCLA is one of the sites where we're collecting uh, data on um, kids who are in this early teenage uh, uh, period, extensive questionnaires and brain scans and everything else. And now a bunch of COVID questionnaires so that we can learn about what's happening uh, to their social development, to their mental health um, and to their brain development. And, and hopefully we'll, we'll learn soon what's going to happen because we really can't prevent it from happening, whatever it is. Yeah, scary. It is scary. It's really scary. Um, I have time for just one more question. Cooper writes, my essential pod of girlfriends are all watching with me from their respective homes. And Cooper's we're pod, yay. <laughs> as we watch with some questions. Do you have group text chats with friends? We often have hilarious and moving message threads that are sometimes a better connection than our weekly Zoom cocktail calls. Um, sometimes that, I have a big one that goes with my family all the time and they're so chatty. Oh my gosh, but it is nice. Yes, sometimes and that can be, yes. Uh, you know what else is nice is shared photo albums. 
um, if you have a photo album on your iPhone or whatever, you can share that with your friends. And sometimes I found, find that to be nicer than, than these large group chats, because when I'm in a large group chat, everybody's saying something always. And I find I can't do anything else because, you know, it's ding, ding, ding all day long. Um, but having shared pictures, I think is nice. It just gives you um, a warm sense and it doesn't have to be current pictures. It can be remember when we did this. And that, that's um, uh, grounding, I think. That's a wonderful suggestion. Um, well, I, I hope everybody in their pod, I, I've had people in my pod texting me while this is going on, saying what a wonderful conversation that you two superstar women are having. Um, we'll do one last question uh, from Susan. This is such a great Zoom, so relatable. What do you think of post-pandemic, ability to go out and about and about the anxiety of that. I know a lot of people are very worried about when things do open up. They're very anxious about it. And also um, the impacts on marriage, partners, significant other relationships, which I know, Sandra, you've touched on with the flip-flops. And Susan, you've mentioned the noise. And I could add to that too. <laughs> so I'm in a pot of two here. Um, I can actually relate to the flip-flops. I actually went and purchased um, not Javianas, the, the one that actually has a, a Tebas because the flip-flops were driving me crazy. So, <laughs> so, but as to close, if you could just comment about, you know, our, our anxiety about going back out when we are able to do so. How are our brains going to deal with that? You know, it, it's anyone's guess right now. I, I think a lot of it will depend upon what are the conditions in which we're going out to. Are we going to be going out into conditions of continued uncertainty? I think that we have it in our minds that we're going to get a, a miracle vaccine and everybody's going to get vaccinated and we're going to go out and be safe. But that's not going to be the reality. It, it looks like it's going to be, well, there may be some vaccines. They may be partially affected. There's still going to be this disease. It's still going to go on for a while. It's not gonna be a, a light switch getting out there. And I do think that the world's gonna change. I, I think that a lot more people are gonna start working from home, realizing that they can work from home. Um, I also think from a mental health perspective, we've learned that you can do therapy um, on Zoom and people who would never have gone to therapy before, um, who were agoraphobic or just too depressed to get up, suddenly have access uh, to therapy and to treatments. And uh, fortunately, our state regulators have been very good at changing some of the insurance laws so that therapists can actually get paid for doing Zoom therapy. And I'm hoping that those changes will remain um, because I think that we're gonna have a lot more mental health access than we ever had before. So I'd like to think in the end, it'll be a plus. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, I and this is a totally just different tack, is I think understanding the what the risks really are, it. it and what they're not. It's like, there can be, I'm not saying over, it's kind of like, I have a friend who has just not been out. Like, can. I think we're losing you, Sandra. Yeah, oh, a little network problem there. Like she didn't have, oh, network. Okay, just quickly, do you have me? Okay, I'll finish. Okay, and, and just kind of, you, and, and it's kind of like the risks are kind of interesting. At, at a certain age, if you're 75, 80, there's more of a risk of showering, of tripping in the shower than smoking a cigarette if you've smoked and you still, it's kind of like, there is, there's all these, we, everything is a bit of risk that we're always taking and even driving the car is more dangerous than being in an airplane. I'm a terrible flyer, so I'm happy not to fly, even though it's safer than driving a car. So to a certain extent, I think that it'll be, to a certain, we're, we're not shrinking away from death, at some point we have to go towards life and whatever that means and if we can do it safely, but understanding the risks and not maximizing them, not minimizing them. But, and I, I remember I had also a, a family and their kids were 14 and they had never actually spent a night away from their kids because they were very protective parents. So it's like, you know, we're gonna understand the risks and go forward, but we have to go towards life and not just away from risk, I think. That would be my, not a good answer, but. A great answer. It was a great answer. And on that wonderful note, I want to thank Sandra, Susan, for this great hour that I think lifted everyone's spirits. 
Um, and it, especially during, uh, this was just, it was a wonderful hour and we were so appreciative of what you gave to us in this hour and your humor and your intelligence and all that you are. Um, so thank you so much for sharing this hour with our Open Mind audience. Um, I wanna wish everybody a good night and be safe, be well, and we'll look forward to seeing you at future programs. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you.